um, Alexis Ojeda Brown. I am the program and education coordinator for the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum and the DEAI specialist for the BMI. Um, I'm very excited that multiple of my favorite organizations have come together to talk about the intersection between civil rights and labor today with the bio where you can work campaign. And I'm very excited that all of you decided to spend your lunch with us today. So we can go ahead and get started to the next slide. Oh, we can go back. <laughs> A little bit. So just a little bit about this series. This is a new series that the BMI has come up with specifically uh, by Dr. Rachel Donaldson, the curator of collections and exhibitions at the BMI. She came up with this Lunch and Learn series and specifically the first topic that we're talking about today. Uh, Rachel has a, a background in labor history and we're really, really excited to see what she, pres uh, what she has for us in store today. We can go to the next slide. So just a little bit about our partners before we get started. The Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum is located on 1320 Utah Place, and it is the former home of Baltimore civil rights activist and legend, Dr. Lily Carroll Jackson. She was the president of the Baltimore NAACP chapter from 1935 until 1969. Uh, and during that time, Dr. Jackson led uh, voter registration campaigns, anti-lynching campaigns, work training and desegregation campaigns, uh, working alongside people like Thurgood Marshall, Carl Murphy, and Clarence Mitchell Jr. Um, so here's just some information about the Lily Curl Jackson Museum and the legacy of the museum ties in very nicely with today's topic. Uh, for Lily Curl Jackson, we have a photo of her here in the middle. Uh, often referred to as the mother of freedom. Um, before she even became president in 1935, she still uh, led a career of activism. Um, even in 1931, her daughters, which also were very active in Baltimore, we have Juanita Jackson Mitchell and Dr. Virginia Jackson Kaya, they founded the Citywide Young People's Forum in 1931. Um, and you'll hear more about the Citywide Young People's Forum today in regards to the Buy Where You Can Work campaign. And the Citywide Young People's Forum basically laid the foundation for the NAACP's Youth and College Division, which Juanita would have gone on to create a couple years later. But we have some photos of the officers. Juanita was the president uh, in 1933. You have a photo of one of their anti-lynching campaigns that they ran again. Um, and during this time when it was founded in 1931, Virginia was 21 and Juanita was 19. So we're gonna be hearing a lot about the youth and the role that they played in the civil rights movement as well, or the early civil rights movement. A lot of people think so civil rights as the 50s and 60s, but in Baltimore, uh, it starts way, way before the modern civil rights movement. So we can go to the next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about life on the avenue, what Pennsylvania Avenue is and the significance that it has to West Baltimore history and Baltimore's history overall. So in the early to mid late 20th century, West Baltimore's Pennsylvania Avenue was basically the epicenter for black art and entertainment businesses. Uh, while living in Jim Crow Baltimore, the avenue was where black Americans went to see the latest films at one of the many theaters, uh, enjoy a drink at popular nightclubs or bars without the insult of segregation. Uh, notable establishments were the Royal Theater, the Sphinx Club, uh, the Regent Theater, and these establishments made Pennsylvania Avenue the ideal stop on what was known as the Chitlin Circuit. So the Chitlin Circuit uh, helped many Black American musicians, actors, comedians, and other entertainers flourish during the era of racial segregation. When Black Americans weren't allowed to perform at white establishments, it was Black-centered venues like nightclubs and theaters and juke joints along the East Coast and in the South that gave these artists a platform. Uh, for example, New York had the Apollo, DC has the Howard Theater, in Baltimore, uh, we had the Royal Theater on Pennsylvania Avenue. So we had artists, legendary artists like Marian Anderson, Cab Calloway, Billie Holiday, uh, Duke Ellington, James Brown, many, many more uh, performing at venues on Pennsylvania Avenue and frequenting establishments there. Despite the haven that the avenue provided for Black life in Baltimore, it was not perfect, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, and civil rights activists like Lily Carl Jackson, 
Thurgood Marshall and Carl Murphy from the Afro-American newspapers grew up in West Baltimore and Pennsylvania Avenue was the backdrop for their community advocacy. Uh, to talk more about where you can access resources or, and learn about the history of the avenue, uh, we have Deborah Wood from the Maryland Center for History and Culture. So we can go to the next slide. Hi, thanks, Alexis. Uh, my name is Deborah Wood. I'm the Museum Learning Manager for the Maryland Center for History and Culture, and I am very grateful to be here. Uh, thanks to the Baltimore Museum of Industry for hosting this event and giving us a chance to connect our exhibits and our collections to this important topic in, in Baltimore and in Maryland history. Um, a couple of the photographs that we had on the previous slide and the ones here are by Paul Henderson, and we are a repository for the Paul S. Henderson collection. Um, he was a photographer or a photojournalist for the Baltimore Afro-American, in addition to his freelance work. So he, during his, his time, it captured many significant places and moments in this history of civil rights activism, especially in Baltimore, um, just as Alexis was, was saying. Um, so we have, we have a number of his photographs, but we also work with Afro Charities, um, which is the repository for Baltimore Afro-American um, to, to bring in these photographic resources of this time period. Um, you can access a number of the resources that we have in our collection through our digital collections here on our website, mdhistory.org. Um, in addition, um, we, I want to talk a little bit on the next slide about uh, our, one of our newest exhibits. After years of preparation and consultation, we just opened this exhibit in May of 2022. Um, it's called Passion and Purpose, Voices of Maryland's Civil Rights Activists. Um, and it actually opens with the story of Juanita and Virginia Jackson organizing the citywide Young People's Forum and the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign. One of the things that I think makes this exhibit pretty special is that it's founded on our, on our extensive collections of oral histories. A lot of those oral histories come from um, two sets. There's the Jackson McKeldin collection, which is a reference to Lily Carroll Jackson and Governor McKeldin, as well as from the Doris M. Johnson collection. Um, in particular, I want to highlight um, some of the, the oral histories that we use in our, in our section on the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign, which include um, inter interviews with Juanita and Virginia recounting their eyewitness perspective um, to how this, this event unfolded. Um, some of these oral histories are also accessible from our website, mdhistory.org, and our digital collections. Um, and you can also find more information there about how to plan a visit to our museum and or our library for those of you who are interested in exploring how we can help you um, learn more about this time. Uh, thank you again to the Baltimore Museum of Industry, to everyone else in this event. Um, I am looking forward to, to listening and to, to learning more. So thank you for that. Um, so we have our partners. You can learn about the history of Pennsylvania Avenue um, at MCHC, at Lily Curl Jackson, but also we're gonna try and bring it up into the present as well with our next partner. So we just talked about the history of Pennsylvania Avenue, how it was the epicenter for black uh, culture, arts and entertainment. Um, and while we had such legendary artists featured here, we had significant civil rights activists raised here, Despite this rich history and culture, while West Baltimore and specifically Pennsylvania Avenue has this rich history and culture, uh, because of racist housing practices, urban renewal, and deindustrialization, it basically led to decades of disinvestment in the area. Also, the scars of the 1968 uprisings due to Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination, uh, it casted a shadow over the community's vibrant legacy. But uh, many of the establishments on Pennsylvania Avenue were gone towards the end of the 1970s, uh, but the spirit of Pennsylvania Avenue is very much still alive, especially due to the work of organizations like the Pennsylvania Avenue Black Arts District. And with that, I'll introduce Angela. Hey, thank you all so much for uh, inviting us to be here. 
and be present. Uh, we are the I am a writer, curator, um, art historian, and the lead project, uh, the project lead for the historical photography project with the Black Arts and Entertainment District. Um, we are one of several arts and entertainment districts in Baltimore City. We are the only one who is dedicated specifically uh, and primarily to uh, supporting African American or Black identifying artists based in the city. And we also are charged with making sure that anti-displacement frameworks are set in stone so that those artists have safe spaces to create and to thrive. I am responsible for creating an educational branch for our unit. And so we have created what's called the Historical Photography Project, which looks primarily at historical photographs. Um, it also looks at uh, or, and captures oral histories, and it attempts to map many of the spaces that Alexis spoke to that were storied and internationally recognized, including the Royal Theater, as well as the Sphinx Club on Pennsylvania Avenue that are now no longer in existence. Um, to date, very few of those markers, in fact, only the Royal Theater marquee remains as a kind of marker for the esteemed establishments and institutions, Black entrepreneurial efforts, and uh, arts and entertainment institutions on Pennsylvania Avenue. There are no other markers, and so we are taking it upon ourselves to make sure that there are significant markers throughout the space and that the Historical Photography Project archive, um, which you can view at hpparchive.org, documents and helps people see through an interactive map where those spaces were and what they were used for. And we also are creating a curriculum or have created a curriculum that will help middle school and high school Baltimore City students, especially within social studies and uh, English uh, language uh, and arts, create or utilize our curriculum as an arts enrichment component to help them understand Black histories within Baltimore specific to uh, the legacy of Pennsylvania Avenue. We are incredibly excited that uh, a part of the creative placemaking that we're doing on Pennsylvania Avenue includes uh, photographic murals taken from this archive. And all of the contributions are from many of the partners that are here, but the vast majority are from members of our community um, so that we can help them understand that they are historians and that their archives help are incredibly significant and important to help us fill in the gaps about this lesser known history. The uh, photographic murals will also be enhanced with um, augmented reality experiences. And so we are excited to announce uh, in, at the top of the year that the Sphinx Club on Pennsylvania Avenue will be the first uh, space that uh, receives a photographic mural installation that is enhanced with augmented reality so that uh, visitors to the region as well as local residents can walk up to the Sphinx Club, download an app, and we have QR codes embedded into the mural where folks can download the app and then point their phones in the direction of a photograph of Charles Tillman Sr. as an example, who is the founder of the Sphinx Club and also a significant angel investor and entrepreneur in the region, and then learn history about his contributions to the region, as well as see past performances that used to happen in the Sphinx Club, which featured many, many jazz musicians from all over the world and nation, but especially was a safe space for local musicians and also just learn about why the Sphinx Club was a significant space. We are um, really excited and hopeful that being able to show this space as a kind of uh, demo or beta version of what we can do throughout the district will continue to in, uh, excite other people about realizing that history is active and now and requires the participation of, of all members involved. If you're interested in learning more about any of the components of our project, including the historical photography project, our curriculum, or the augmented reality, reality creative placemaking installations that we are gonna be installing uh, this year and into 2023, uh, feel free to send me an email at Angela at blackartsdistrict.org. 
visit hpparchive.org or visit us uh, on social media or on our website at the blackartsdistrict.org. Uh, I will pass it on to Rachel. Thank you, Angela. Um, this is really great information. Um, and I want to thank you and everybody else uh, for coming. And this is so fantastic to work with such excellent partners on this. Um, before I begin, I just want to start with a note on terminology. Um, I will be using the historical term, namely Negro, when I'm referring to historical movements or groups that use that term. Otherwise, I'll be using Black and African American. And I just want to also uh, echo what Alexis had said about the long civil rights movement, because it's really over the past few decades that historians have been referring to the civil rights movement as the long civil rights movement. And the long here is really meant to show that the Black struggle to gain and to preserve civil rights was far longer than what had been considered the origins of the movement, which is really kind of the post-World War II era. In fact, the movement stretches far back into the 19th century, but today we're going to look at a period when the fight for civil rights became closely intertwined with the struggle for economic rights, a, link with, a linkage that became the hallmark of the movement in its subsequent years. Next slide, please. So the early 1930s was the worst period of the worst economic disaster the country had experienced. And it was during this time that a cohort of civil rights activists challenged the severe economic limitations that most African-Americans faced in cities around the country, specifically by demanding greater job opportunities in service work and in private businesses. The don't buy where you can't work protests, as it became known, emerged from Jobs for Negroes, which was a direct action movement designed to increase the hiring of African-American workers. And by direct action, I mean basically taking it to the streets with visible protests rather than relying on the legal system or for social change. So activists who engage in direct action use such tactics as negotiation, boycotts, and large scale public protests to get white owned businesses in black neighborhoods to employ African-American clerks and managers. The first of these direct action campaigns uh, took place in Chicago of 1929, and they quickly spread around the country occurring in over 35 cities. Next slide, please. Somewhat locally, one of the first demonstrations happened in Washington, DC, um, uh, out of a group called the New Negro Alliance. The New Negro Alliance began in the late summer of 1933 after a white owned restaurant named the Hamburger Grill in the predominantly African American neighborhood of 12th and U Street fired three black workers and hired white workers in to take their places. In response, 21 year old John Aubrey Davis organized neighborhood men to picket the business, holding signs encouraging other residents to boycott the restaurant. Their first battle was actually soon won and the grill rehired the recently dismissed workers. But rather than sit back, the success prompted Davis to organize the alliance along with Belford B. Lawson, an attorney, and M. Frank Thorne. They initially formed the alliance at Law uh, Lawson's law office with the sole purpose of advancing black citizens earning capacity through greater economic opportunities, particularly in the white collar and private service sector. Their efforts included calling on local newspapers to hire African-American newspaper boys, securing staff and managerial positions at a local a and grocery store, and pushing for the hiring of African-Americans in various positions in groceries and restaurants, including the Sanitary Grocery Company, which is a precursor to Safeway. And this was one of their most visible protests. Next slide, please. Their protests, again in 1933, occurred during the depths of the Depression. And the depression was an economic crisis that especially hurt African-Americans because of the long-standing last hired, first fired treatment that they received in service and industrial sectors. Even initial federal programs of the New Deal that were designed to provide much needed jobs, such as the Civilian Works Administration, employed far fewer African-American workers in their DC office, for instance. Furthermore, conditions for already economically marginalized Black Americans, particularly in the South, were actually worsened by New Deal legislation that was supposed to provide economic relief. For instance, the codes that the National Recovery Administration began drafting in 1933 to limit working hours and to establish minimum wages excluded textile workers and domestic workers. 
uh, both of which were two of the very few economic avenues open to Southern African American women. Next slide, please. When the New Deal actually began to open up opportunities for Black citizens with the start of the Works Progress Administration in 1935, many of the work relief and jobs training programs fell along racial lines uh, with opportunities for Black Americans being restricted to low wage positions that mirrored gender and racial economic barriers. And I just wanted to go a little bit of a side note here and explain these pictures. So the WPA offered training programs for women. Um, and these were classes that were designed to kind of help in more kind of homemaking skills. So the WPA offered classes for women and the National Youth Administration offered similar classes for teenage girls. And according to historian Phyllis Palmer, the classes largely taught white women and girls homemaking skills, whereas black women and girls were taught the skills of domestic labor with the understanding that white women and girls were trained in the skills required to maintain their own homes, whereas black women and girls were trained in the skills required to maintain someone else's home. For instance, uh, the homemaking classes taught skills like home decorating and cookie making, whereas the classes in domestic work focused on, quote, laundry work and proper, proper serving techniques for formal meals, as well as the etiquette for answering telephones and doors, end quote. Next slide, please. So it's in this context that groups like the New Negro Alliance and others in the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaigns challenge the limitations that African-Americans were subjected to by focusing on securing jobs in higher paying service positions. But it wasn't just about jobs alone. There was also a clear connection between uh, these jobs protests and civil rights protests where the NNA members also lobbied for a civil rights bill from 1935 to 1939. Others who are also connected to jobs protests uh, and connected jobs protests to civil rights activists, uh, activism were participants in the Baltimore-based Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign, which in this city was called Buy Where You Can Work. And this was from 1933 to 1934. And this drew support from African-American institutions, community groups, and other sources of local support and inspiration. Next slide, please. So again, in the summer of 1933, it's a very important year, 1933, pretty much everything we're talking about happened this year. So during the early summer of this year, an enigmatic a spiritual revivalist named Prophet Kior Costone arrived in Baltimore. And he was a revivalist who emphasized civil rights as much as racial uplift. Similar to Marcus Garvey a decade beforehand, Costoni preached a message of racial advancement through racially conscious economic uplift, meaning that he advocated black entrepreneurship and patronage as a path towards advancing civil rights. So along with advocating residents to register to vote and developing school curricula that emphasized African-American history, Costoni focused on creating and supporting black owned businesses and the hiring of black workers in municipal jobs. The time is right for a jobs protest due to the high number of unemployed black residents, especially among those who worked in the white collar service sector. So shortly after he arrived in Baltimore, Costoni began to investigate the employment practices and policies of white owned businesses that operated on Pennsylvania Avenue. Again, which as we heard from before, was a commercial center of an African-American neighborhood in Northwest Baltimore. So even though almost the entire clientele along the commercial strip of Pennsylvania Avenue was African-American, the Afro-American newspaper reported in 1931 that white owned clothing stores outnumbered black owned stores by seven to one and white owned eateries were double the number of black ones. Um, African-Americans did not own any of the hardware stores and white owned groceries outnumbered black uh, owned ones by 13 to one. So the fact that these white owned businesses would not hire black clerks in this majority black neighborhood was especially galling. In the early fall, Costoni and others, including the Afro-American newspaper, encouraged a boycott and picketing of stores that did not hire black workers or that had fired black workers and hired white workers in their place, which again was the case of what happened in DC at the Hamburger Grill. The first planned boycott was avoided um, when uh, the, a series of businesses, including two five and dime stores, a shoe store and a cleaners agreed to hire African-American clerks. 
The owner of the local shoe store, Max Myers, announced the change to his store's hiring practices during a mass meeting of over 450 people held at the Perkins Square Baptist Church. Yet many other store owners refused to negotiate with the activists and the boycott proceeded as planned. So again, just to echo what Alexis had said, the organization responsible for really sustaining the jobs pro, uh, boycott movement in Baltimore was the Citywide Young People's Forum. It was an organization that African-American high school and college students established in 1931. The organization's original focus was on community uh, education and their Friday night meetings drew crowds of upwards of 2000 people to hear such speakers as W.B. Du Bois, Walter White and James Weldon Johnson who were towering figures in uh, the civil rights movement. They also connected civil rights and economic rights, having started their own mass effort to have Baltimore City schools hire more black professionals, including librarians and social workers. The forum held its first meetings at the Sharp Street Church, but relocated to the auditorium of the Bethel AME Church to accommodate the growing crowds. Even before the jobs boycott that Castonia initiated, the forum had engaged in similar effort to secure greater employment for African Americans in libraries, public schools, and social work. The forum ensured that any jobs effort would aim to help women as well as men. And the boycott began with a demand that stores hire women sales clerks. This inclusion of women reflected the leadership as well as the rank and file of the forum for women constituted a high percentage of both. The key organizers of the boycott, again, were Lily Carol Jackson and her daughters, Juanita and Virginia. Um, and at the time of the jobs protest, uh, Juan, Juanita was serving as the forum's president. Another major partner of the forum was the Baltimore Housewives League, which counted hundreds of African-American women as members. So the first picket line was established in front of the AMP on November 18th and that mobilized the community, including high school students and others connected to the forum, who, as Juanita Jackson later recalled, formed a, quote, army of freedom fighters on the picket lines. As a result, AMP corporate management agreed to hire 21 black clerks within the following two weeks, an effort that was to continue, and, and to hire three black managers by March 1st, 1934, a promise that they kept because by April 1934, the store had a minimum of 38 black employees and two black assistant managers. Now the success galvanized the community and like in DC, rather than sit back, they began preparing for their next direct action campaign targeting Pennsylvania Avenue. Next slide, please. The boycott of 1933 took place on the 1700 block, a single block on Pennsylvania Avenue. Leaders chose to take a focused approach in order to maximize their effectiveness. When store owners on the block refused to change their hiring practices, the boycott officially began on Friday, December 8th, the beginning of the Christmas shopping season. And that was not a coincidence. The picket lines commenced at nine in the morning. By each weekday afternoon, the number of demonstrators ballooned as children joined the lines after local schools let out for the day. One of the few stores that wasn't being picketed was the local aid and pay. Black owned drug stores and restaurants supplied food and other aid to the demonstrators. Local citizens established two food stations and three physicians were on standby should the demonstrators required assistance. And this became more necessary as store owners hired counter demonstrators who violently harassed the black picketers. The Afro-American publicized the campaign on its pages uh, and the community staged mass meetings at the Cosmopolitan Community Church, located at 1112 Madison Avenue to sustain morale. But when the boycott began to have a noticeable effect on business, white store owners sought and received an injunction against the demonstrators. Uh, an injunction, just to explain, is, is a legal ruling uh, where uh, uh, forcing a person or group to basically cease and desist certain actions like picketing. And injunctions at this time were no used notoriously against especially labor demonstrations and civil rights demonstrations too. So after the injunction went into place, uh, fact, um, the, uh, essentially ended the demonstrations on December 15th and it really pretty much ended the boycott. But this was not the end of the Baltimore activist effort to improve African-Americans' employment options in white-collar work. 
The forum lost us has launched a successful campaign to establish an evening training course in salesmanship at Frederick Douglass High School, an African-American school in February of 1934. On the first night, 85 students enrolled in the course. Next slide, please. So consumer boycotts, like the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaigns, may seem like tame protests today, but they were really remarkable in their time. During these demonstrations, ordinary citizens became activists, using their purchasing power to voice opposition to their treatment as second-class citizens. Um, not only did these continue into the 1960s, but they also paved the way for sustained protests that would become hallmarks of the civil rights movement, like the Montgomery bus boycott. And you can also see, again, the connection between civil rights and economic rights in the 1930, uh, 1963 March on Washington, you know, the official name of which was the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which the, the two of these pictures come from. So even today, economic protests are ways that enable anyone to leverage their own not buying power to challenge injustice and inequality. Next slide, please. And if you are interested um, in these topics, in addition to seeing the, um, the, the exhibition at the MCHC, Alexis here has recommended these books um, as, uh, as a way to learn more about what happened specifically in Baltimore um, and the civil rights movement in the city at this time. Um, next slide, please. And we wanna hear from you. So if you have any materials or documents, papers, or objects relating to this jobs protest or any others in Baltimore, please contact us using this link. Um, and you could also email me directly. Uh, my email is rdonaldson at thebmi.org. Um, and so for our remaining time today, um, I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, if anyone has anything that you would like to, to know more about, um, I know that there are a couple things that I, I skimmed over a little bit. So if you ha have more contextual information um, that you would like to discuss or have anything that you would bring up, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and while we're waiting for questions, I'll just go ahead and say uh, thank you to all of our partners. Um, we're very, very excited. I think for me, being working for both the BMI and LCJM, I think it's really great that we have uh, museums and cultural institutions uh, building bridges and working together and finding similarities in the histories that we all share. Um, so I'm so happy that the Black Arts District and Maryland Center in History and Culture were also able to join. Uh, speaking for Lily Carol Jackson, I've partnered with all of these organizations, um, and I think this was this was a great um, event. So thank you, Rachel, for for bringing this up. And for a question, do you all partner with the Lewis Museum? Uh, so for the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we have not had a Lewis Museum partnership yet, but you know, we're all about building bridges and making connections. So absolutely, uh, we are looking forward to, to having more joint programs with other organizations. And uh, Dr. Iris Barnes, who is the curator and um, assistant director for the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum just commented, it's inspiring for the youth, youth to understand the power they possess. Uh, and I think that is probably one of the biggest takeaways um, for the Buy Where You Can Work campaign and just Baltimore's role in the civil rights movement. The youth definitely powered the civil rights movement, starting with Juanita in Virginia with the Citywide Young People's Forum, uh, and then even going to, to Morgan State University with the first lunch counter sit-in of the civil rights movement at Reed's Drugstore Pharmacy, uh, and the work that they did at the Northwood Shopping Center in the 50s. So, so absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that too, because if you think about the civil rights movement, so many of the actions, particularly by the time you get to the 1960s, were led by students. 
Um, if you think about the sit-in movement, uh, of course, started by four college students and spread to uh, cities led by college students around the country. And interestingly, in um, Charleston, South Carolina, it was really led by high school students. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, there, you do have this thread throughout this period of students really being the driving force for change, particularly um, using direct action to, to do so. Thank you, Linda, for, for putting some recommendations. So they said, check out A New Deal for All, Erasing Class Struggles in the Depression Era Baltimore by Ander Snopes. Sorry if I messed that up. Um, but they said that Andor conducted many hours of interviews with Juanita Jackson Mitchell, among others. So thank you for sharing those, those resources as well. Another question is, how did protesters deal with the pushback from police, white-owned businesses, and other racist groups? Yeah, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to dig into the um, oral histories uh, to really kind of get at more of those details. Unfortunately, when an injunction gets issued, that's kind of like, that's all she wrote. Like, and that's why the, um, you know, it went into effect on December 15th. And then that was kind of the end of the um, public protest because the police would be involved there at that point to make sure that demonstrators were not there um, or, you know, not staying in front of in front of the stores. Um, so, uh, so I think that that's, in terms of dealing with it, I, that's why I kind of concluded with having um, the uh, uh, school course on salesmanship to be, um, that, that was initiated because it's a ways that you could take this. So yeah, it's not a direct action protest, but it's a way to kind of keep this energy and funnel it in directions where um, they could still have an impact um, even in not kind of a direct way. So I think that that would be a way that they, again, were able to sustain this momentum um, even though they weren't, able to use that same method, essentially, of the boycott itself? That's a great question. Um, I'll also say for how did protesters deal with pushback from the police? Uh, the police actually showed up, I believe it was the Bethel AME Church looking for, um, oh God, what was, how do you pronounce his name, Rachel? Cons? Con oh, okay, Custone? <laughs> Custone, yeah, yeah. The, the police actually showed up at the church looking for Custone, um, and members of the forum and community members basically kind of stalled them as he went out the other way so the police officers couldn't couldn't get them. So it was definitely a huge community effort. Uh, they all supported each other. Um, and for the injunction, Custone was specifically called out. So was Dr. Jackson and Juanita. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was definitely community efforts to to get around and protect each other. Yeah, yeah, and, and just another thing to connect it to at least the ideas that have been percolating. And I mentioned Marcus Garvey earlier. Um, the Gar Garveyism and the Garvey movement of the 1920s, uh, which is where you could really see some of the origins of, of black nationalism, emphasized economic angles and the idea of um, advancing or having again racial advancement was through building up. Uh, the economic power of the Black community. Um, so, and Garveyism was particularly strong in cities. I unfortunately don't have um, a record of how much, how strong it was here in Baltimore. Um, it was very strong in New York City. Uh, but you can see again how that idea percolates, you know, even into the next decade and influences uh, these, movie, these movements again, again, connecting the idea of civil rights to economic rights and economic power. And on a community level, not just kind of building up one's own individual wealth. Uh, someone mentioned how they were impressed by the work of women, especially in the, the Jackson Mitchell family in the civil rights movement. And absolutely, I think it is so important, especially that Rachel brought it up, that women were definitely fr the front runners in these type of campaigns, uh, especially in Baltimore. Uh, Dr. Lily Carol Jackson, her daughters Juanita and Virginia, um, some of the, the earlier figureheads of that movement. But going on, you have Victorine Adams, uh, who became the, the first Black woman city council member um, in the later half of the, the modern civil rights movement. Uh, you have uh, so many other Black women as well. So come to the Lily Carol Jackson Civil Rights Museum and you can learn more about these women. <laughs> 
but also someone mentioned if this would be available for students. Uh, this lecture has been recorded. It will be posted on the BMI YouTube page. Um, and specifically talking about students, Angela Carroll mentioned that the Black Arts District has a curriculum uh, that is available for students who wanna learn how to preserve cultural memory and learn how to become an archivist. Um, the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum also has a curriculum about the long civil rights movement that talks about um, the importance of Baltimore uh, on a national level. Uh, it talks about the civil rights movement from a local lens. And then of course, Maryland Center for History and Culture also has a curriculum work um, and resources for teachers. So if you know any teachers, some Baltimore City public school teachers or teachers in general um, that would like to introduce their students to these type of topics. All of our partners today have resources for schools, teachers, and students. Thank you. And uh, Linda Stropes had a question about the relationship between the white and male dominated um, labor movement and the don't buy where you can't work campaigns. And that's a really good question. I don't know um, specifically what the connection was, particularly in Baltimore. Um, a couple of things to consider was that this was very much kind of a middle class movement. Um, at least in Baltimore and DC, um, like the, the New Negro Alliance was started and led by um, upper middle class men. Um, and uh, same thing here was that it, it was more of kind of a, a middle class rather than necessarily a working class movement. Um, and that doesn't say, that's not to say that members of the labor movement weren't involved. Um, I just don't know uh, what those kinds of connections were. Um, the other thing to consider is that these were actually a couple things. One, it was a short protest. So they started on the 8th and the injunction went into place on the 15th. You know, there it wasn't uh, kind of, I, I think, enough to really generate um, uh, more widespread partnerships beyond, you know, the groups that initiated that. And this is kind of, this is my conjecture. Um, the other thing is looking at where it took place. So Baltimore, as Alexis mentioned, being a highly segregated city, this is a protest that is taking place in a predominantly, if not exclusively, Black neighborhood. So it's not directly affecting um, like white working class neighborhoods. So um, that's just something to kind of think about um, whether or not that had a direct effect on the movement itself. I'm not sure, but those are just, if I were to say, just to, I guess, uh, kind of bear those in mind. So it's not really an answer to your question. But it's just some things to kind of think about what could the kind of context around that and whether or not uh, the labor movement did have much of an effect on that. But that's something that I, I would like to look into. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, so Peter Van Buren asked, um, there of city school history programs on Baltimore's Black history that was created by MCHC and others. Uh, can you tell us more about this as it relates to today, today's topic? Deborah, do you want to speak on that a little bit? I'm happy to. Um, so we do have a civil rights in Maryland school program that we offer to middle and high school students in particular. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be in, in contact with anyone who's interested in, in scheduling one of those programs or learning more about it. Um, but we, we focus on our, our Passion and Purpose exhibition. Um, so that includes you know, students learning about the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work um, campaign, as well as additional um, instances of activism around this area and, and from about the 1930s into the 1970s, uh, as well as we try to engage them also in primary source analysis. Um, related to these topics. Um, and for Lily Carl Jackson, we've actually partnered with Baltimore Heritage and the Maryland Center for History and Culture with our long civil rights movement curriculum. Uh, for Lily Carl Jackson, we made sure we incorporated field trips, whether they be on site or virtual or even going to the classroom itself. Um, and we partner with Baltimore Heritage doing walking tours of the Marble Hill community um, and also uh, on-site tours at our museum. And for MCHC, we've also incorporated a field trips with them with that curriculum as well. So really getting students to see their city see the significance of their city, specifically in Marble Hill. When we're talking about Juanita Jackson and even Clarence Mitchell Jr., her husband, 
how you're walking around Marble Hill. We have their row home. We have the Jackson Mitchell Law Office and um in our community as well, just a couple blocks behind the Lily Carol Jackson Civil Rights Museum. And these buildings are boarded up um, and people are walking by these boarded up row homes having no idea of the significance that these buildings played uh, in desegregating Baltimore and creating history on a national level. Um, and that's really what our curriculum is all about. Showing students that Baltimore, uh, especially West Baltimore, is a place of power and the legacy of Dr. Jackson and Carl Murphy and the Mitchells and so on is one that they can inherit. All right, do we have any other questions before we close out? Let's look. Um, and while we're waiting for any more questions, uh, there is a feedback survey uh, in the chat. If anyone would like to give us feedback on this Lunch and Learn, uh, we really want to bring, uh, the BMI definitely wants to bring more programs like this. We want to make sure that this time and this format works for you all. So we'd love to get your feedback. Um, we had a really great uh, turnout today. So thank you everyone who, who joined us for that. Thanks. And I would also like to add, if there are any topics that you're interested in, um, anything that, you know, connects to, to labor activism or the labor movement, um, uh, especially like, like these the, kind of like the intersections between movements, uh, please let us know. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for your lunch break. Um, we hope you enjoyed the topic and our Lunch and Learn. Uh, thank you to all of our partners who joined us today. So Maryland Center for History and Culture, the Pennsylvania Avenue Black Arts District, Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum, and of course, the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Um, and we'll let you guys go finish your lunch, you know? So thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Thank you.